<laughs> Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 9th, 2015. And this is the week in charts. Michael says, get in the zone. Yeah, I like, I've spent a lot of my order in cash in AutoZone. Well, we got a lot to cover this weekend. You know what? You're going to see that this week, I really mean it. And it's not like I have one big topic. I just have a lot of little things to cover. And you know me. Sometimes I could um, go off on a rant or two. Surprising and shocking, I know. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew to help me get it all in. The makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this free endorsement. And I was searching out other companies which had delicious, I wouldn't say nutritious, but delicious and uh, equally caffeinated drinks. And Red, and, uh, Red Bull said it was too fat. So, uh, well, I'm not going to say what I want to say. There's a disclaimer screen. Let me just sum it up for you. All predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. You read the book. You like the book. People all the time email me, hey, Dave, love the book. Put me on review. Well, out of the hundreds of emails, there's 130 or 40 reviews, so somebody's holding back on me. But if you don't mind, throw me a bone. Uh, you can go straight to Amazon. And you can use this tiny arrow to get there. And the reason I ask for this, and I know people that uh, that are used to that are here every week are, like, rolling their eyes. But the reason I ask is because every night I need to get a malignant review up there that reviews the reviews, which is the stupidest thing. Ever. Anyway, I won't get into that. You can watch Week of Chart recordings if you want to uh, rant on that. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today. Um, I got asked to cover the open portfolio, and I always love to show it when uh, when asked, especially when conditions are, uh, are doing pretty good. I want to continue, and I hate to call it a rant, but I want to talk a little bit about psychology today and uh, doing the right thing, and I think this is vitally important. Uh, trading sardines, to those of you who know the sardine story, I'm sure your eyes are glazing over, but uh, I want to rehash on that based on what's happened recently in the IPO market. Based on recent emails, um, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of stock selection. And I also want to talk about the IPO bull market. And if you hang with me, it's going to be worth $107 to you. All right. Last week, I talked about doing the right thing, and I went off on a rant because I've had people email me for 5, 10, and even 15 years, and I, I felt like I was kind of harsh on these people, and then I went back and watched my video from last week on YouTube, and I got to thinking, you know what? No, I wasn't harsh on them, and they need the tough love because Let's say you're five years into this process and you're still emailing me crappy stocks and you're not listening to what I say, then maybe you shouldn't be trading, okay? Or if you're serious about it, then get serious about it. I don't want to see an email from you 10 years from now, 15 years from now, doing the same exact thing. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over but expecting a different outcome. So if you do want to be serious about trading, you don't have to rush out and buy a course tomorrow, okay? But that should be your ultimate goal to get some courses from me so you have all the information. But start small. Pick one pattern. You can get all that free from me on my website. Listen to my preachings each week in these week of charts. Make sure you're honoring your stock, not hoping for some stock to come back. Make sure you're not cutting your profits short, which we're going to talk about in just one second. Make sure you're picking the best stocks you can, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in one second. And at least watch all the free stuff out there. I've got, uh, I think it's an hour and change video on stock selection. If you go to the stock selection course page, you can watch that for free. Or if you're watching a recording of this on YouTube, poke around my YouTube channel, and you'll see I have an hour just on stock selection. So watch that, and, and that will at least get you down the road quite a bit, and at least you will be making a lot of the common mistakes that I see being made over and over again. So 
you need to do the right thing. And this was where this article reminded me of an article I did last year. And we talked about this last week, too. So watch last week's show if you get a chance. Um, but I did an article on this last year about doing the right thing. Because sometimes people do the wrong thing, and they know they're doing them. And Livermore wrote about that years ago in uh, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, a book I would highly recommend you read. Read it once a year, read it twice a year, um, throw it in your car or any place else where you might get stuck and have some idle time. Uh, every time I go through it, I learn something new. My, my copy is dog-eared and beat up. I, I, I did acquire a rare copy of it, which um, I'm now going to save and not read, but uh, I digress. But anyway, do, do get that book and do read that book. And it's a very worthwhile read. Um, and, and like I said, Livermore talked about people making mistakes and know they're making them. Uh, I see it all the time. You guys are probably sick of me telling the story, but I'll try to sum it up as quickly as possible. I had a client once couldn't make any money, and it was over a period of several months. And we did okay to trade service. Quite frankly, I, I wasn't happy with the results. But the results were positive, and, and they were okay, okay, not, nothing to brag about. And I said, all right, let's, 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 let's look at your trades. And he, actually, he forced me to look at his trades. He said, here's my trading account. I want you to log in, and I want you to print off these trades, and I want you to go through these trades. So I logged in, downloaded all the trades, put them in a spreadsheet, and I noticed that most of the trades were my trades, but there were 20 day trades as one particular security. So I added everything up and taking my stuff over that period of time, like I said, two or three months, I forget exactly how long. It wasn't a great period, but it was in a black by several hundred dollars. Again, I'm not bragging about my performance. It was a flat market time, but at least it was in the black by a few hundred dollars to make it all worthwhile based on his trade size. And he had over $5,000 of losses day trading this one particular stock. He had 20-something day trades in this one particular stock. And I said, okay, if you're going to follow with everything I said, you would be in the black, not by much, nothing to brag about, but at least you kept your head above the water. But these 20-day trades cost you a $5,000 and change loss. If you would just take these day trades out in this one stock that I never mentioned ever, I don't know if ever, but I certainly didn't mention it over that period of time that I was looking at. If you took out that, all those day trades, you would actually be profitable. And you know what he said? He said, I know, I know. So he knew going in, but it's like he didn't want to recognize that. So I'm not a psychologist, nor do I play one on TV. I did have freshman psychology one-on-one, -on -one, and every now and then it does rear its ugly head. And I can't tell you why we do that, but if you, if you do want to do some things that you know you shouldn't be doing, I thought about this this morning. Maybe we need to do things that we may, maybe need to do a little bit of things we're not supposed to do. Maybe it's just in us, okay? But at least follow the core methodology with your main trading account and do the right things on your stops. Don't play crazy out of the money options. Don't trade triple leveraged inverse ETFs. All these little things I preach about. Don't do all that. Now, just for S and G's, if you want to open up a small account and experiment with it and do the wrong thing and trade those crazy out of the money options and stupid ass ETFs that are triple leveraged invert or whatever. If you want to poke around and experiment with that kind of stuff, knowing that every time you do it, you're going to be frittering away a little money, then, then yeah, go ahead and do that, okay? And maybe learn, learn your lesson with a small amount of money. And who knows, you may get lucky. The reason to use the word luck is because I think that's more gambling than anything. But if you're following the system, there's going to be losses, okay? But longer term, you should do just fine. It's, it's a very basic trend following method. I added the um what do you call it? Slogan byline, what you call it? Trading simplified to my website. 
So every time I look at my website, it reminds me, I've got to keep, keep it simple. Don't try to overcomplicate it. Don't try to overthink it. So anyway, this is the article if you want, to, if you want it. Um, oh, Michael, good point. Uh, you know, good point. Okay, yeah. Uh, Michael says, I disagree. It reinforces bad behavior, bad habits. Okay, so, you know, maybe I just caved in. Let me think about that. Yeah, maybe I just caved in by saying, hey, go out and, and do those crazy things, but do them in a small amount if you have to do them. You know what? Maybe I need to retract that. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Good point, Michael. Thanks for um, thanks for keeping me straight. I appreciate that. So I guess we need to back out all that. <laughs> I guess the point is, if you're going to do something crazy, recognize that you're doing something crazy and do it with a small amount of money. Whatever you would pay to go uh, for it. I, I don't play golf, but I know it's not cheap. I've, I've played a little bit in my life. I try to play only once a year at maximum. Um, I usually get dragged into a game somehow. And I suck at it, but I know I suck at it. But, you know, uh, so what? I don't, I don't play that often. Now, before I digress too far, the point I'm trying to make is, oh, too much money, dude. The point I'm trying to make is whatever I would spend, $100, $200 or whatever it costs to play golf, and I guess you guys play golf a lap at that. I mean, it's probably a lot more than that. But I play on a, a course over here nicknamed the Pastor <laughs> when I do play in it. It's all, I'm only out about 100 bucks what I do. So, just see it as frittering away somebody for some entertainment if you feel like you must do that. And don't blow 5K in your trading account day trading when you're only making a small amount of money based on the, on the market conditions. So I, I hear you on that, uh, Michael. So maybe I do need to track it. Anyway, uh, download this article if you get a chance. Um, DaveLander.com slash free reports too. And then there's another free report I have which is a 21-page report. If you just go to my store uh, and click on free reports, you can get that report there. Uh, eventually, I'll probably incorporate all the free reports together, but I just haven't uh, built or had the back end built for a lot of these things just yet, but I'm working on it. Anyway, so that's the article. It was in Traders Magazine, September 2013. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, you know, shout out for traders. I got an article coming out in... I don't know if it's this magazine or next one, but I've been writing quite a few articles for them over the last several years. Uh, big fan of their magazine. I just think it's uh, very professional and well done. So uh, if you do get a chance, go to Traders. Let me just give them a shout out. Um, I think it's Traders-Mag online. I can get you the, ac the actual link after the show if you want. But go there and uh, register on their website, and then you can have access to uh, all of my old archives, articles there, plus obviously everyone else. Okay. Yeah, it's too late. It's in, <laughs> Michael says it's too late. It's in everybody's head, uh, just like a jury. All right, I want to strike those comments from the record. Don't rush out and do something stupid, even in a small way. Okay. And I guess the only reason I'm saying that is if you feel like you must, then then know you're making that mistake and, and, and do it in just such a small way. It's not going to be meaningful, and hopefully you'll learn your lesson from it. But maybe that's a Wrong thing, wrong thing to say. We all know that experience is the best teacher. And I have a really funny story on that, but I, I better hold off because we've got a lot to cover. Okay, Michael says he's working on some of those same issues himself. Well, here's the thing. I don't know if I said it already, but the reason that I love talking about psychology so much is because I fought with those demons, for lack of a better word, early on. And there's been a lot of ups and downs in my career. It's a little bit of a niche thing. What hasn't destroyed me has made me stronger. Okay? A lot of things I don't really care or want to admit. Maybe we'll have a beer or two someday if we meet up, and, and I'll tell you some, uh, some war stories. But you have to learn from those mistakes. You have to learn from those ups and downs. And then you have to do the right thing. Now, again, just because I decided to become a trader doesn't mean I no longer have a pulse. And guess what? The same thing goes for you. Uh, I've actually been doing a little bit of reading and research on this, and the name escapes me. I should know it because I was just reading about it recently. But we have a small part of our brain that, that controls our emotions, okay? And it's much smaller than the larger logical part of our brain. But we cannot make decisions 
without those emotions, okay? So you have to learn to embrace those emotions and know that you will be a little emotional. And I'm going to talk about a few tips and tricks here in just one second when it comes to riding out winners. And there's a lot of things you can do. Like this morning, um, I, I, I'm kind of a quirky guy. Uh, my, my daughter last night was, one of her vocabulary words was just eccentric. And uh, my mom says, your father. You know, <laughs> she had to define it. And she, uh, uh, my wife, Marcy, pointed at me. You know, that's, there's your definition right there. But one of the things I started doing recently, I don't know why, but as I told you uh, many times in the past, if I have a losing position or I come in and check the screen and, and things aren't looking so hot, I'll drop an F-bomb and get pissed off. But lately, I guess it's kind of a practice what I preach thing. And last couple of weeks, I've been trying to say you got to be kind of goofy about it and, and try to diffuse yourself. And lately, in, in fact, just this morning, something was going against me. Instead of dropping an F-bomb, I've been doing the, uh, what do you call it, when they put that mute on the trombone, the, uh, the plunger or whatever. I've been going, womp, 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 womp. And I've actually found myself laughing at the situation. Okay, now, my stop's not hit, so what? It's not going to go up every day for my lungs. I know that. But instead of getting all caught up and, and waste all that mental energy because something's not going my way at that particular moment in time, I'm just diffusing myself by being goofy. Now, some of you guys are probably thinking that's crazy, but next time you drop an F-bomb or throw something or scream or holler or whatever, Think back to that and try to diffuse yourself. And as I've said many a times, not all the time, but many a times, I'll come in the office, drop a few F-bombs and say, F this, and I'll go for a walk around a block, which my block's about two miles, so it's a pretty pretty good walk. And I'll come back in all sweaty and all, and then all of those positions have changed and are now in the plus column. It's like, why did I waste all of that energy? So I, too, am susceptible, easy for me to say, to these psychological demons, for lack of a better word. I'm human, okay? Practice does not make perfect. Only perfect make practice makes perfect. Ooh, that's a little deep, Heather, but I like, I like where you're going with that. That's, uh, yeah, Denise uh, Scholl, I think it is, and I'm actually reading uh, some stuff that's where the original scientist that did a lot of the work was quoted. And I don't have his name. Uh, handy and all, so I don't want to start quoting too much because I, you know me, I'll, I'll get, uh, I'll start talking about this person that said this, and I can't remember the name, and I feel bad about it. Um, but yeah, I, I hear where you're going with that, Heather. The point is that deliberate practice. So this is something that Linda Rasky has talked about before. This is something that um, Malcolm Gladwell. By the way, I read everything by Malcolm Gladwell. Huge fan of Malcolm Gladwell. Okay, it's a it's outside of trading, but he really makes you think, and I love that. And the point about deliberate practice, and I think he talked about it in the book Outliers and other books, and there's other books out there. Uh, a couple of weeks ago I said, don't bother getting talent is overrated, but I was quoting somebody else because they, they said that's because I read some other books. But in, in, since then I've actually bought the book Talent is Overrated, and I haven't read it yet. But I'm sure, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to tell me that, you have to practice, and the, the, the way to get better is deliberate practice, and that's why I've been preaching so much about how I look at 2,000 charts every day, and I was trying to add it up last night, and 2,000 charts a day, 250 trading days a year, times 20 years, I, I, I punched it in my calculator last night, that's quite a bit, I was in a webinar with uh, Market Toolbox last night, and it's, it's, it's millions and millions and millions of charts, and you see the patterns reoccurring over and over again. Like I said, if you want to get better at being a musician, you want to practice your instrument. If you want to get better at reading charts, you want to look at a lot of charts. And someone said in here last couple of weeks, they said that, uh, I think it was Satchimo once said, Louis Armstrong uh, from New Orleans, I've got an airport named after him down here, uh, he said that if I don't practice one day, I can hear it. But if I don't practice two days, my audience can hear it. Or if I don't practice one day, I know it. If I don't practice two days, then my audience knows it. So deliberate practice, very important. Um, again, I'm kind of a sucker for all the psychological stuff, but or psychology stuff, I should say. 
So, but I think it's important. So do a little research into deliberate practice. And the bottom line is when you're looking at charts, try to get better. If you see a stock that took off, stop and look at that chart for a minute and say, is there one of the patterns that I trade there? Is there something that was tradable there that I could have seen a couple of days ago before it took off? And if there's not, move on. But maybe after the, repeating that process a few thousand times, you may either discover a new pattern that might be tradable, and that's how I come up with new research, or you might see something that you already do about, okay? You might see that bow tie, you might see that first thrust, or the pullback, or the trend knockouts, or the accelerating momentum strategy, and things of that nature. So you might start seeing those type of patterns, okay? Rules, test, 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 modify rules, test, 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 and repeat. Well, be careful if you're doing something mechanical because you don't want to end up curve fitting. But, yeah, I hear you on that. Tiger must be behind in his practice. <laughs> well, Tiger's got some other issues that kind of that kind of mess things up. But, but I will quote, my favorite Tiger Woods quote is uh, – um, Someone, an announcer, once asked him, a broadcaster, whatever, announcer, what do you call those people? Uh, once they asked him, Tiger, what do you think? What do you think about right before you hit the ball? And you know what his answer was? Very slowly, he said, hitting the ball. Like, what are you thinking about? Hitting the ball. Okay? So we need to be like Tiger in that aspect. We might need to be careful about these other things that Tiger did. But looking at the athlete, in and of himself, that's a wonderful thing. So think about making the trade. Think about picking the best. First of all, think about picking the best stock to begin with, okay? This is going to dovetail into this electric cardiogram talk we get ready to get into here. But you want to think about doing your best. You want to think about picking the best stocks. Then you want to think about your trading plan. And then you execute that plan, and then there's nothing else to do but follow the plan. I know, easier said than done, okay? I wrote a few Snatch the Pebble columns a while back, and the Snatch the Pebble was, I think it was in Kung Fu, and the Grasshopper could snatch the, the pebble from Sensei, or whatever the guy's name was, that he has achieved the true enlightenment. Well... You know, for me to pass that torch on to you, you just have to do a few simple things. And it's not that complicated. I never said it was easy, okay? But again, I don't want to hold myself up higher and mightier. I still drop F-bombs. I still get upset. I still get bummed out doing drawdowns, okay? But as I get older and older and older, I've learned to live with those things. The other thing, too, is um, <laughs> since I turned 50 a few months back, uh, it's like a switch has been flipped, and, and I'm not becoming that crouchy old man, but I'm kind of looking at everything, and I'm trying to see what's worthwhile and what's not. You know, I'm not I'm not the crouchy old man just yet about kicking the kids out of my yard, but I find myself tolerating less and less things. Okay, and one of the things I'm thinking about is is I'm not going to nurse these people along anymore. You're either going to do the right thing. Or you're going to either have to quit trading or stop bugging me. And, and that's, that's it, period. And those of you who have emailed me and have, have, have gotten the courses and on the service, et cetera, you'll know that I'll go to the ends of the earth to make you successful. I'll do whatever I can. Okay? You've called me before. We've emailed. And I don't mind doing that because I kind of get off on seeing someone else get successful. And it makes me better, too. And it makes me want to be better. But I'm talking about someone who's, Never going to spend the time reading the book. Never going to spend the time going through all my free videos. It's not just buying something. They're not going to spend all the time listening to what I say in all of these free videos and free PDFs and everything else and free reports. They're not even going to do that, let alone are they going to study the courses, which get into a lot more depth to take things to that next level. So it's not going to happen. Okay. All right. Um, I got asked about this stock a few days ago. Now, if you are the gentleman that asked me about it, I'm not picking on you. 
keep in mind that I get charts like this all the time. And poor guy, he's thinking, oh, man, I'm never going to send him another chart again. No, it's okay if you're newer to trading to send me a few charts that look like this. But the point is, I want to get you up to speed as fast as possible so you're not picking these charts that look like electrocardiograms. So you start looking for persistency. You start looking for those ten trend knockouts. You start looking for that acceleration in trend. And the article I have coming out is going to be on the accelerating momentum strategy, which was in my second book, Dave Landry's Ted Best. So uh, keep an eye out for that in Traders Magazine. And once it comes out, I'll, uh, I'll put the PDF up on the website. So in that article, I talked a lot about consistency and the trend knockout. And then in prior articles, I also talked about persistency and the trend knockout uh, and the importance of those type of pads. And if all you did was trade, uh, for instance, persistent pullbacks with trend knockouts and accelerated trends, you wouldn't have a boatload of stocks to trade. You'd sit on your hands a lot, but your trading would get a lot better, and your stock picking would be uh, pristine almost, just trading those few pads. Okay. So anyway, uh, so I'm not picking on whoever sent me this chart. I'm just trying to um, help you learn from your mistake. So look at this stock. It just it goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. It's all over the place. Oh, wait a minute. This is electrocardiogram. Never mind. Okay, look at this stock. It goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Big old gap down here, straight up, back down. Okay, and even if you didn't know anything, where is it, 48? Where was it a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, four months ago, five months ago, six months ago, seven months ago, way back September, it was at $48. Now, this is the worst example I've ever seen, but it's pretty damn bad because, and I couldn't do it because I've, I've got a new Photoshop on my new computer that I have here, and I just didn't have the time this morning. But I wanted to take, I wanted to see if I could make this transparent and layer it over on this chart just to see if we could maybe line them up as an EKG. So I think that would be a wonderful experiment to do, to just to see <laughs> if the chart truly is an electrocardiogram, and it does look, in fact, the electrocardiogram, if you look at it, actually has a little bit more structure than the uh, than this actual chart here, okay? How many months of trending action do you like before you start considering a stock as a persistent pullback candidate? Um, I like about 20 days of persistency, and that's roughly one month, if we're looking at that one pattern in and of itself, okay? Now, one thing I have learned, and this is the beauty of, of, of me being in this educational business, and this is what I love about the educational business, is it makes me better. And one thing I've learned, even in more recent times, is that short-term persistency can be very powerful. Now, it's not necessarily a, a persistent pullback if you've got five or ten or, or so days of persistency, but it might be persistency within a bow tie persistency within a first thrust or some of these other patterns that we trade, okay? So keep an eye out for persistency, even if it is just over a few days. Very, very, very powerful concept. And that's the beauty of me getting up here and lecturing is that it reminds me of some of these things. And that's why I, I enjoy writing articles and all this other stuff. In fact, I just can't wait to get back to I've been so busy lately with so many other things. I'd love to get back to writing new articles and the research and everything else because that's that's fun. To me, I feel guilty doing that. I feel like I feel like I'm goofing off when I could, you know, it's like, how is this productive? And it's like, no, Dave, it's good. It's good for you to do these things. And I learn a lot in the process. So uh, and I'm glad you guys are willing to listen to me. So thank you so much for that. Okay. Curve fitting, fitting is an old argument. Well, curve fitting, you, it, it, that's a fine line because you got to be careful. You can't, and I spent a lot of time work, uh, building mechanical systems early in my career. I have got a degree in computer science. I thought I could use my programming, not programming knowledge to build systems and find that holy grail. And I, found, I would tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak until the numbers got really, really good. But more importantly, you want to find some sort of reoccurring pattern, and it might not be that perfect. And that's kind of something that was kind of weird early on 
it's a little counterintuitive. If you find a mediocre system that has an edge, this is gonna, I'm gonna probably go on a limb here, but I'd be willing to bet if you found a mediocre system that had an edge, a mechanical system, I'd be willing to bet that that edge might continue into the future. But if you find some incredible edge, it's quite possible that your curve fits up, okay? And I see it happen, not so much curve fitting, but I'll see like a volatility of market drops down and people will sell options and think, oh man, this is, this is great. So, or sell, or like they might be, market might be kind of choppy and they'll sell calls or they'll do like a covered call strategy and think, oh, this is, this is great. This is, this is a beautiful strategy. And then what happens? The volatility increases or something increases and then that no longer works. So you've got to be careful in what you're observing to make sure it's something that will work longer term. And that's where looking at the charts and learning how to read charts is vitally important. And I would encourage you to do that versus the mechanical testing. Now, I, I shouldn't preach against mechanical trading too much because it, it's all part of what makes me me. It's all, you know, those mistakes I made in the past are all part of what makes me me. The mistakes that you've made in the past are all part of what makes you you. So you can't go back in time and try to remove that because that is part of you. But through that mechanical testing, I learned a lot about how markets work. I learned a lot about how your stop has to be outside of normal volatility. I learned that from a lot of the mechanical testing. So I'm not going to say totally avoid looking at things on a mechanical basis, but don't get too caught up in it because there is always a possibility of a um, curve fitting nature. Anyways, uh, anyway, to um, before I digress too far, this is what electrocardiogram looks like. It's just a stock that's all over the place. And if you don't take home anything today, just you don't want to trade stocks that look like this. I know I'm preaching to the choir for everybody that's here today, but for those of you who are watching recordings of this on YouTube, you don't want to trade stocks that look like electrocardiogram. Now, I don't want to brag too much about my European brethren and my Italian brethren, but one thing that, that really jazzed me or really got me jazzed up, and I haven't seen it as much over here, maybe because I'm doing more webinars over here and the sound's turned off, so I don't pick on you guys too much. But what I saw over in Europe was this, uh, this excitement to learn, this like sponge thing. And when I showed electrocardiogram chart and explained to them, if you hear beep, beep, beep in your head, then it's probably a stock you shouldn't be trading. And then when we got to this part where I went and picked stocks in their market that I thought looked good. It was kind of fun because when we started getting to the electrocardiogram looking stocks, I wouldn't say anything, and then people in the audience would start chiming in, beep, 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 beep. So they got it pretty quick, okay? So that was kind of exciting. So, no, you guys, you guys, you guys are smart. You know that. All right. Um, anyway, soft sell here, stock selection course. We talk about a lot of these things in there. What I do, of course, as you may or may not know, what I do is I don't want to cherry pick a bunch of stocks and say, hey, look at these stocks. Aren't I great? Isn't this great? Now go out and do it. What I do is I might have a few cherry picked examples, but I'll show you why and how I think those examples. And I want to show you the repeatability of it, how you can do it again. So what I do, of course, at the end of the course, I go out and I pick stocks and like for the stock. Selection course, we also did this over a period of weeks. And with the IPO course, we also did this over a period of weeks, too. So it's it's not only see it in hindsight, but let's see it in real time and see it actually work. And so these are the stocks that I actually I spent um, hours and hours, about six hours lecturing. And then this is these are the stocks that we picked, and that's the moves that they made over the next uh, few weeks. Anyway, that spreadsheet's on the um, stock selection course page if you want to look at it. Also, if you do go to this page, scroll down a little bit, and there's that one-hour video I was just talking about. So, okay, uh, getting a few questions about, hey, Dave, what's in the open portfolio? And these are the uh, these are the stocks that are in there. Uh, most of them are doing pretty good so far. Knock on wood. Uh, this is an energy stock. This is a an IPO. These are relatively new issues in here too. Yeah, this is a big winner, obviously, in the portfolio. This one's not too shabby though. Okay, so uh, these big winners are important, and you really want to ride out these winners 
as long as possible. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. But there's the uh, there's a portfolio snapshot. Uh, this is being recorded, so you can hit, hit stop, obviously, if you want to analyze these further. I'm not going to get into too much um, details on this because we've covered it so many times. But just kind of in a nutshell, it is 100K, 2% per position, and that's if stopped out, okay? So this is where your stop would be based on the underlying volatility of the market. And then these are the shares, amount of shares you would buy. And you add these two together. Okay, it's one position divided by two. And I put one as a, a trading loaf and one as a trending loaf. So we know going in, when we hit the profit target, we're going to get rid of these. And then we're going to keep these for hopefully a long, long time. Anything that's in yellow, um, I'm sorry, anything that's in yellow and doesn't have a white counterpart, such as these down here, these are newer positions. They haven't hit the profit target um, just yet, okay? But you notice that the share size varies based on the size of the stock. Anyway, I don't want to get too far into that because we've talked about that quite a bit. But that's the open uh, portfolio. Now, I've poised this question before, but I see we have a few new, new people here. Uh, do new people have the new people smell? You know, you got a new car, new car smell. I'm wondering about that. Anyway, the question is, why do stocks exist? And don't tell me for a company raised capital or whatever. I'm, I'm phrasing this question. Why do stocks exist for you? And there's only one reason. Anybody care to answer that question? So why do stocks exist for you? Profit. Thank you, Michael. Michael is Michael is on the ball today. <laughs> that reminds me of a joke. Hey, Michael, you on the ball? Bounce up it? No, never mind. Um, yeah, that's why stocks exist. And that's the only reason that stocks exist for our purposes, okay? And we can talk about altruistic purposes or capitalistic purposes, for the underlying companies, et cetera. But stocks only exist for our, the only purpose is to make money, to profit, okay? And I started to get into this, but I'm gonna, I'll, do, I'll do an introductory video later. And I think I have done some before, but I'm going to do a more formal one, more professional one. But I've done videos before where I show a stock certificate and I show a picture of a company. And those two things are not the same thing, okay? Stock may be gone... I'm sorry. Uh, see, even I am interchanging them, in, interchanging them incorrectly. A company may be going great places, doing great things, but if it's not reflected in the stock, you should not be in that stock. And then, unfortunately, and more perverse, sometimes just the opposite happens. And that's why I want to talk a little bit about IPOs. And that's why in the IPO course, I named it the promise of the future. Okay, the, the Maybe they will cure Ebola. Maybe they will make the best yoga pants on the planet. Maybe they will make the best burritos on the planet, okay? And maybe I'll get some of those yoga pants after I eat too many burritos, you know? Um, but maybe they won't. Maybe the unrealized reality will set in, okay? Every now and then, though, you might be on to something. You catch the mother of all trends. Now, I know I recognize most of you here, so I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much. So I know your eyes are going to glaze over <laughs> if I tell the story one more time. But keep in mind that hopefully somebody else might occasionally uh, might end up watching this, and this is why and, and may not have heard the story. But the old trading story about the sardines is that there was a bubble in sardines, and people were trading tens of sardines, and the, and the price was getting higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And higher. And one poor sap that bought right at the top of the market was holding on to the sardines. And he says, you know what? I'm going to have myself a very expensive lunch. And so he opens up a tin of sardines, and they stink. They were rotten. <laughs> and he says, wait a minute. Let me track down the guy that sold me these. And he ran up to him. And he said, you sold me some rotten sardines. And he's like, silly fool. Sardines are for trading, not eating. Those are easy for trading, not easy. So never forgot that story. And it, it's, it's been around a few times. I've heard various forms of it. So you need to think about a stock as 
You know, don't eat me, trade me, okay? And a stock is a trading vehicle. Now, we've had positions in, in the core portfolio, and I haven't personally, but the reason I say the core portfolio is because that's something that's public. I can point to it and say, you see, we actually did this, okay? So, but we've had positions in the core portfolio that have gone for as much as I think two and a half years might be our record there. And I'm slotted as a swing trader because you can only predict the short term, and that's what I preach. But you can stick within the position as long as it moves in your favor. You can stay as long as you behave, okay? It's what you, what you think about, what you need to think about with the stock in your portfolio. Anyway, so you got to think of stocks as trading vehicles. And this is especially true with the IPOs, and this is why my IPO course, I really harped on the concept of sardines and actually put a lot of little fishes on all the little charts or quite a few of the charts we talked about. In fact, you can see that in just one second. Um, I'm a big fan of symbolism, and it's, it's kind of, I've been asked a lot lately, what, what type of, what do you do to, um, what are some tips and tricks to deal with some of these psychology issues? And, and I have a lot of little goofy things, like I said, like that we get stopped out. I, I, you know, I shout out in a British voice, I say good day, sir, instead of dropping an F-bomb and things like that. But their symbolism does help. And uh, back in my business card, I have a little up arrow, a down arrow. And a side, sideways arrow, I keep that on my desk. I also, if you want one, um, send a self-address stamped envelope to my address, which if you have my newsletter, it's in the bottom of the newsletter. And I'll be happy to, uh, to send you one. And a lot of people have requested those, and it's, it sounds kind of quirky, but tape it to your monitor and look at it. And if you're trying to make something happen in a market that's going straight sideways or a stock that's going, more importantly, a stock that's going straight sideways, it's kind of a constant reminder of what you should do. But anyway, this is actual uh, snapshot of a snapshot. How old am I? Jeez. <laughs> I, I still call, this is a Cajun in me, but um, I think I still call a refrigerator an icebox. So... Uh, Anyway, on the wall of my office, I have this uh, sardine drive sign, and I'm looking at it right now. It's a constant reminder to me that we're trading these stocks, okay? We're not eating them. And this kind of dovetails in nicely to um, this was a stock that was actually recommended in the first session of the IPO course, VTAE, and the buy point was right here. Okay, now keep in mind that you, you might not recognize this pattern because the IPO patterns are a little bit different than the core methodology patterns when the IPO is very new. Once the IPO has been out for a little while, a lot of the core methodology patterns began to uh, show up. In fact, I'm going to show you one of those in just one second. But there are some breakout characteristic patterns that I do trade in IPOs, at least early in the process. And you can see the buy entry was here. We took partial profits pretty quick, a couple days later here, okay? And then the stock ran up nicely. Now, unfortunately, it came back in and stopped out. Now, this is a considerable amount of money to give up, but this was a very volatile stock. And net-net, you have to look at things net-net, which I'm going to harp upon in quite a bit in one second. It's still a pretty good trade. So, they're for trading not eating. And one thing that I harped upon in the course is that many times they fly, but then they also die, okay? Back here, this is the euphoria. This could be the greatest, greatest thing ever, ever. And then over here, it's what I call the rotten reality realized, okay? Rotten reality realized is when things begin to set in, okay? Every now and then, they go and go and go, and that's great. But a lot of times they take off and come right back in. Well, if they run up 100% and you're able to make 60, 70, 80% of that run, plus take some partial profits for an overall decent trade, then pat yourself on the back and move on. This brings us to our next point. How much is enough? This is an open trade. It was an IPO breakout pattern here. I recommended it in my core trading service because it was a nice pullback. Uh, who was asking about persistency? Heather. 
let's look at the persistency here. Tends to go up day after day. You can draw a line and intersect almost all the bars. Let's count the bars. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay? So it's not quite that 20 that I'm looking for in a persistent pullback, but it's the first pullback in an IPO, which is a very tradable pattern. If all you walk away with today is to trade first pullbacks and IPOs that look like that, something that I talked about way back in 2000 in my first book, 15 years ago. You see what I'm saying about these people that have been emailing me for 15 years? All you have to do, I know, easier said than done, but all you have to do is trade stocks that look like this, okay? Not stocks that look like that. But you can see it's plain as day. And there's, again, there's a little breakout pattern here that's pretty obvious to me. But even if that's not obvious to you, you can see we've got a nice little pullback, okay? So, so far in this position, this was in the open portfolio. Uh, based on the snapshot this morning, it was up 90%. Is 90% enough? No. Okay, Dave? What about 200%? No. What about 1,000%? No. You want to make as much as possible. We talked about hunting black swans or outliers. A few weeks back, kind of beat the dead horse on that. But you want to make as much money as you can on any given trade. Because trust me, you're going to have losses. You're going to have plenty of losses. That's one thing I probably preach too much about. I often say that I'd probably make a lot more money on the education side if I stopped talking about losses so much. But you know what? I want long-term client relationships. I don't want to turn and burn. And I know there's a lot of that in this industry. And I know that, that people are going to turn and burn me, and that's just the reality of it. But ideally, I would like a long-term relationship with people who are successful longer term. So it's a win-win, okay? They make a lot more money off of my advice than they did paying for that advice, okay? Or my education, I should say. I can't call it advice. <laughs> it's just educational purposes. But the point is, you want to make as much money as you can on a trade because you're going to have losing trades. That's one thing I can guarantee. Again, there's with the losses again. Now, keep in mind, you will have 9,000%. Well, 9,000% might be enough, but you want to make as much as possible. And as I often preach, if you're up 20% and you quit, you're never going to make 40%. If you're up 40% and you quit, you're never going to make 90%. If you make 90% and quit, you're never going to make, as Michael pointed out, 9,000%. Okay? The bottom line is you have one or two of these big trades per year. That's all it takes to make your year. Okay? There was a, a little position that we went into a while back in the model portfolio. $2,000 was at risk. You made $1,700 in the first low, so that almost wiped out the entire initial risk of $1,700 profit, and then it closed out at thirty-something thousand dollars. So that's about a six hundred percent. It's about a six hundred percent gain on the actual underlying security, and that's a pretty good. That's a pretty good return on a hundred k account. So if you did that, if you made thirty something percent on just one stock, even if you screwed up a little bit on some other ones, which you probably will. That's, I can't guarantee. There's that loss that you're talking about. You're going to still have a pretty good year. If you can catch a couple of those, you're going to have a fantastic year. So it's never enough. Guess what? You're going to have to give up some of those open profits. I don't have time to tell a story now, but trust me, no one brings a bell when the market tops. I'll have to dig that out of one of my old columns. So here's a few things to remember. Let's say you've had quite a few losers lately, and then you finally catch a winner. Human nature is going to tell you to take that profit, because that profit is going to make you feel good. You're going to have some money, and that's a good thing, right? Unfortunately, your current trade has nothing to do with trades past. As Tom McClellan's mother says, people buy stocks. Oh, sorry. Everyone uses timing in their trading. Some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, and others use more sophisticated methods. Okay? Brilliant quote. 
So don't sell because you have some reasoning which has nothing to do with the stock. Let me reiterate that. Don't sell a stock for a reason that has nothing to do with, with the stock. Well, how do you know to sell? Well, when it hits your stop, your trailing stop, you're out. And realize you're not going to get top dollar, but if you quit 100%, you'll never get 200%. Okay? My favorite example, I think it's CTLT. I forget the stock. I'm pretty sure it's CTLT. We'll have 211%. Well, we got stopped out at 150%. So what? Okay? Or Dave, when do you quit at 200%? Well, how, do, how did I know? Excuse me. That it wasn't going to go to 400 percent. I had a crawfish omelet for breakfast. I think the crawfish were maybe a day too old. So hopefully I'll make it through <laughs> this webinar. <laughs> um, anyway, I didn't want the crawfish to go bad, and obviously they, they already did. But I digress. Um, so yeah, don't think about your recent trades. Don't let that bother you. Don't monetize the open profits. Okay, you you should have a trading account, and that account should be only for making money, for adding capital gains, for capitalistic purposes. I'm trying to choose the right words here. And you want to make as much money as possible. If you have to take money out of your trading account to cover uh, short-term expenses, then, then maybe you shouldn't, shouldn't be trading that money. You should be trading. Maybe you trade a small account where it's not as meaningful to you and so you can still learn. As I've said before, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader, so I don't want to tell you to paper trade because you'll never learn the psychological aspects of trading unless you're putting real money on the line. But maybe have a smaller account to where you can do the right thing and follow those rules. If you're trading with an account where you need the money, it makes it a lot tougher. It goes back to Miss Marion's quote about, Mary McClellan's quote about, they said you're going to have to sell when you need the money. So, but be careful not to monetize those open profits and say, you know what, I could buy a classic car with that money, or I could go out and buy something of a, something that you desire, or whatever. Okay, or you might think I could pay three bucks mortgage with that money, or whatever. So you have to have those funds separate so you can trade. And if you have a, 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 a crazy good year, then, yeah, by all means, I'm not saying take the, take the profit on an individual position, but if you have some excess capital, when do you ever have excess capital, huh? It never seems to be enough. It comes with money, right? Then take some money out of your account and treat yourself to one of those aforementioned items or take care of some bills. But don't look at a, any given trade and cash out on it. Now, every now and then you might get lucky and cash out on the exact top, but I guarantee you 99% of the, the rest of the time, or even if it's just 1% of the rest of the time, you're going to miss some huge winner, and that winner you'd have made 10 times more than the buddy you cashed out on. Trust me. Sooner or later, that's going to happen, and that's what we're chipping away at it, and that's why... We're looking for that big outlier, that black swan that I talk about so much. Now, do be willing to give up some of those profits. Parabolic moves aren't sustainable, but trends often are. Let's take a look at this trail that we're long. Okay? It's going up. Uh, what is that? Round numbers. Let's say I'll just eyeball on that. Uh, about 100 percent, 100 percent. Okay, it's going over, going up 100 percent over a very short period of time, over two months. Okay, that does not mean it's going to be up 800 percent by the end of the year. It probably won't be. It might. Okay, but we're never going to find out, or we're never going to make that 800 percent if we bail out now. But do be willing to give up some of your open profit. Yeah, I don't know if I sound like him, Michael. I'm not going to say the guy's name because he's, he disagrees with me on a lot of stuff, and I think we agree to disagree, but, but I'm not going to say his name. Um, so go out and watch uh, other uh, videos out there if you want to learn from that particular person. Uh, but maybe we agree on that one particular point, okay? So, yeah, uh, will um, – Trill go up 200% over the next couple of months? I don't know. Probably not. 
It's probably not a sustainable move. It might be. I don't know. But that's what a trailing stop is for. And you do have to allow for these corrections to happen. Okay, before I get to that, just keep in mind that what makes trend following works is a lot of times trends go much further than most are willing to believe. 2000 and, um, or early 2000 and late 1999 was a wonderful example of that, okay? The people who confused the issue with facts, they did not go to www.donotconfusetheissuewithfacts.com. That website does exist. And they said, you know what, the stock has no fundamentals, it's stupid. They're not, it's a, uh, CMGI came up last night in the webinar about just a stupid web company that bought up a bunch of web companies. And there was nothing there. It was just a, a paper tiger, is that the word, or a paper shell. It was just all BS. So what? You know, it, it went up <laughs> significantly. And a lot of people lost their buttocks trying to short it. Eventually, they were right. But if you run out of money in the meantime, what good is that? Okay, you get bragging rights? Well, what do you do? You know, this the the road of Wall, the road to Wall Street, the road to Wall Street, road to hell is paved with uh, right with people that are right with early. The road to the bankruptcy court is paved with uh, people who were right with early. But anyway, trends will go a lot further, and last a lot longer than most are willing to believe. Not everyone, but quite often they can, and that's where the real money is. Uh, corrections are healthy. It purges out the fast money. And it can actually clear the way for higher prices because the eager shorts come running into the market with the to correct, begin to correct. I mean, that's the psychology behind a trend knockout plan. It knocks out the the fast money, the people without staying power, the, the Johnny come latelys, and it attracts the eager shorts. And the predicament of those aforementioned mentioned traders can help propel the stock higher or whatever the market may be. So corrections are healthy, and they're actually a good thing, okay? Now, it sucks while you're in the position and you're riding on a correction, but your trailing stop is going to take you out if you're wrong. And, and trust me, nothing's perfect. It might hit your trailing stop and then take off. That's possible. But if the correction isn't too bad, it might be a normal, healthy correction, and the market takes off again. So you might be up, like right now we're up 100% trail. It might pull back over the next few weeks or a few days or whatever. And we might only be up 80% or 70%. And then if it takes off again, we might be up 150%. And then it'll pull back a little bit. Then we might only be up 120%. Okay. Hopefully rinse and repeat. And as you know, I try to keep as many open, I try to keep it in as many open positions on as possible. Okay. Uh, in, in these presentations. Okay, and that's why I showed you, if you go back, that's why I showed the open portfolio. Here's my point. My point is that I plan on using these as examples for a long, long time, hopefully a long, long time. So a year from now, if you're watching this presentation, hopefully we'll be still talking about Trill, and this number will have a one in front of it or two ones in front of it, or as uh, maybe, as Michael says, maybe three nines in front of it, okay? And this will be a $50,000, $100,000 gain. Okay, so I like to use as many real-time open examples as possible so you can see it actually work and not like, oh, look how great this was, you know? Anybody can do that. Okay, it's like um, Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. Everybody knows that. I see potential in you and you. <laughs> now, keep in mind that when you are trading a stock, and let's, let's look at one that stopped out. Let's take a look at this IPO. You've already taken off half your position here, okay? And you get stopped out, so be it. So what? At least you made this much, and at least you made this much. So that's better than a poke in the eye, and that's only over a few months. Rinse and repeat that a few times, and you, you, you're you setting yourself up to have a pretty good year, and especially if you catch an outlier by following this plan, okay? And that's going to be the great thing. And then maybe this one, again, might turn into a big outlier for the year, but you've already reduced your exposure by taking some money off the table. Now I'm looking back, I'm not looking at current exposure, I'm looking back to the exposure where you started with the position, okay? Now like Michael says, 9,000%, well if you're up 9,000%, you have my permission to take some more money off the table, pay off your house, pay off your cars, do whatever you want, 
But hold on at least to a piece of that position to see if it goes up 18,000%, okay? But I'm talking about the next two, three, four, five hundred percent. Try to hang on to that via a trailing stop. And that's the other beauty of, again, me having this educational business. I'm forced to follow my plan publicly through the service and say, you know, because people email, hey, Dave, it's up 200 percent. What should I do? Well, where's the stop? Uh, did you stop your hit? No. All right, and then keep following your plan. Okay. So again, you've already lightened the load a little bit. Okay. And I hate to use this saying, but I don't have a better saying. If somebody out there can, can give me a better saying for this, I would love to, um, to incorporate it into my presentations and maybe even give you a, a high five, okay, for doing so. But um, I said not. You're now. This should be you're now playing with the market's money, okay? And that means you've already taken your profits out, and it's just it's open profits. So if you get stopped out, as the next line says, never forget to say, hey, so long and thanks for all the fish. That was that was great. Net net, I made X amount in this trade. That's better than the poke in the eye. So long and thanks for all the fish. You can't look at it and say, well, I was up, I was up another two thousand dollars here and, and I didn't get that extra two thousand dollars. So what? Okay? You followed your plan on a net net basis, you put some money in your account, that's a fantastic thing. Now start. Now go out and find another one, okay? So never forget to say so long and thanks for all the fish. My point here, though, is that, and again, if somebody could give me a better way of saying it, I would love to use it. But you're you're now playing with the market's money. Once you get that initial profit out and you stop bump to break even, barring overnight gaps and other exclaimers, blah, 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 close Close a uh, box before striking, uh, case of rash, discontinued use, and so forth. But barring overnight gaps, the worst you could do is break even on that trade. And then if you could just let it go and see it psychologically as the market's money and not monetize it, then there's a chance you might stick it out and it could turn into the mother of all winners. All right, even any any um, any questions on what I've said so far? I know I've kind of rant, went on rants, but that's just uh, me. Okay. No, it's it's all your money. Continue following good rules. Well, no, my point, Michael, is okay. You you obviously okay. Michael knows um, what he's doing. It doesn't sound like he has these. He's he's got his psychological demons uh, under control. But my point is, do whatever you have to do to wrap your head around things. And that's why I use that. I think there's a better way of saying it. But, again, I call it the mar playing with the market's money. Yeah, it's your money. But then if you start thinking about it being your money too much, you start thinking about whatever you could buy with that money. And you start to monetize it. And then it starts to affect your opinion, okay, or your trading, I should say. So my point is just to... Try to see it as as just just numbers on the paper. You know, my broker early on, uh, futures broker from way back in the day, 1994, 93, 95, somewhere in there, right around the time I incorporated, uh, incorporated. it's not an incorporation, it's an LLC. What do you call it when you form an LLC? Forming an LLC, I guess. When I formed my LLC, Cynthia Trading, my broker back then, we would talk a lot about some of these psychological things. Uh, and he said, you know, I just like to play a game. And this game is make the numbers get bigger. And I like that. It's kind of like he, he saw it as a game, and that's how you play the game. Now, sometimes it's a little counterintuitive. You have to let the numbers get a little smaller in order for them to, to get bigger. But if you kind of just view those little blips on the screens as making the money, as making the numbers get bigger, then you're going to do just fine. And then part of the rules is you have to be willing to, to lose a little bit. But see it as a game. Find what works for you and stick with it, okay? Okay, what else? I have the book. A few false staffs. <laughs> what do you say? A few false staffs? Okay, shares left. I know someday trading 
techniques is relevant in cases of gapping stops, stops, etc. All right, Shay's left, so I'm not sure what he's saying. Um, way back in, you mentioned a few beers. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the problem. Is like I go off on a rant, then I look at the screen. I'm like, what are you talking about? I have a, I own a microbrewery or a nano brewery, I should say, 20 gallon brewery. What the wife could buy with all the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited about Rich says, sorry, Dave, got the dreaded blue screen on my laptop. Too many porn windows open, I guess. Anyway, I'm back. Glad to see you're still going. Well, thank you. That's, that's, I'm more, I, wow, I'm more excited than porn. That's pretty exciting. Okay, um, here's the thing. The IPO bull market continues, and I was doing this webinar last night. And um, and uh, Bill uh, McKinney was um, pulled up uh, FinViz and was looking at the IPOs that I've given him uh, several months back. And he says, well, a lot of these aren't doing so well. And I said, yeah, but that's the beauty of it. It's like the demarcation. And I've been preaching this for months in, this, in these wiki charts. The demarcation is so much better now. It's like you have, they either die or they fly. And you can do the old Will Rogers is it Will Rogers? Uh, buy stocks that go up. They don't go down. They, they don't go up. Don't buy them. And that's been working out uh, nicely in these IPOs for quite a bit. Okay. Um, so, again, demarcation is just really increasing the fly or die, and that's actually a good thing. Yeah, Will Rogers got it right here. So it's the Will Rogers trades really worked out nicely. Um, if you want to go watch the video I did on IPOs, it's a um, shameless plug. It's on my sales page for the IPOs, and that's trade IPOs after DaveLander.com, www.DaveLander.com, trade IPOs. And then if you punch in this code here, and it's all caps, IPO107, the number one, the number zero, the number seven, um, I'll take $107 off. It's promo code. I put it in right before the show, and it's going to go until Monday. I don't know if it's Sunday night. I think it might end like Sunday night, So, but I think it's good until Monday on that. Uh, here's my store, DaveLander.com slash store. I've kind of revamped everything. And then, again, there's a free video on this page, and there's a free video on this page, and there's a short little video on this page, too. So there's some, some video information. This, this is about a, these videos are about an hour each, okay? And there's some good stuff in there if I say so myself. And you can find those on here. Anyway, a couple of um, announcements real quick. Um, for those of you in a trading service or anybody who has courses, I've been rolling out a new video delivery system, and it's just fantastic. Uh, you could use them on your Android. You could use them on your iPad. Watch them on your iPad. You could watch them on your iPhone. You could watch them on your iRon. Um, I've been a little neglect to my mobile people. And my Apple people, because I'm thinking, who in the world is going to watch my trading videos on an iPhone? Okay? And nobody has an Apple computer out there. Everybody's got a PC. We're, we're business people. Right? Well, I was wrong on that. So my apologies. So I finally updated my technology. Uh, having some growing pains there. I'm working a lot on the back end. But the front-end testing has been phenomenal. So you're going to see a vast improvement there on that. Uh, stock selection course, I just mentioned that. In any course that I do, you have unlimited lifetime support. Now, that doesn't mean, hey, Dave, can you help me build the trading system? No, I'll help you do that, maybe. But that's going to cost a lot of money. I'm going to price myself so high that you'll probably can find somebody much, much cheaper because that's not the goal of these courses. And that's not the goal of the lifetime support. The goal of lifetime support is, Okay, Dave, here's a stock that has persistency. It has no overhead resistance. It's set up. The sector looks good. The market looks good. It has adequate volume. What do you think? I, I like it a lot. What do you think? And I'll say, yeah, fantastic. Good job. High five, okay? And if you send me one that looks like a ledger cardiogram, I'm going to say, somebody needs to go rewatch the course. <laughs> so that's what a limited lifetime support means. If you see an IPO, take the IPO course, you see an IPO 10 years from now, 
And God willing, I know you get hit by a beer truck between now and then. Call me up, shoot me the email. I'll help you decide whether or not that is an IPO based on what I taught in the course. And also, any follow-up sessions, like if I do a new improved or a, a course on one of these things, you'll get free access to that. If I do any follow-up sessions, because um, I might do some follow-up sessions to this IPO course, showing some of the things we just showed here and some, and some other stuff, and some possible new patterns that might be developing, then you'll have free access, access to that too. So any course you buy, free access to the course. If I do a, a stock selection course next year, you want to come for free, come on in. Love to have you. Okay? Anyway, I think the sale ends on Sunday. I said Monday, but I meant uh, Sunday night, Sunday at midnight, and it's IPO 107. All right, let's, boy, I have pontificated quite a bit here. Let's hop out into the charts and uh, see what's going on. Give me one second. The shift gears. Oh, here we go. Okay. Let's take a look at the overall market. Let's start with the macro and work, I'm sorry, just the opposite. I always say that wrong. Let's start with the micro and work out to the macro. Okay, S&P 500. We're kind of stuck in the sideways range, hence the, the arrow. I need to change my default color back to, um, to blue so I can continue to draw the blue arrows. Years ago, my paint program defaulted to blue. And that's how big blue arrows uh, became part of what I do. And I, I, my production company is Big Blue Arrow Productions. And um, anyway, I'm always talking about the Big Blue Arrows, and that's where that comes from. For those of you who didn't know, if you didn't know anything about markets, you could say, "Well, where's the S&P 500? 2075." Where was it uh, a week ago, a month ago, three months ago? Where was it? Where was it Thanksgiving Day? 2075. Okay. So it hasn't made any forward progress. Yes, longer term, it might still be in an uptrend. You back that chart way out. Okay. But intermediate term over the last several months, so far, it's trading mostly sideways. Okay. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Now, one thing good about the piece, let's go back to those just for one second. We're not that far away from all-time highs. About 2% and change maybe, or I forget what it is today. Let's see. Oh, no, 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 a little bit, little bit, little bit less than, uh, way less than 2%, a little bit more than a percent and a half away from all-time highs. So when you add or near new highs, you want to air on the side of the longer term trend. You want to err on the long side when you're at or near new highs. Now, if we start breaking down, and let's say we take out the bottom of this range, then all bets are off and things begin to change. We'll, we'll, we'll like Justice, what's his name, Justice Potter Stewart, I think. We'll know it when we see it. So let's take a look at the 200-day moving average. That's a 100-day. Let's take a look at a 200-day moving average. I bet you 100 bucks. Oh, no, it's actually above the bottom of the range now. That's interesting because I thought it, just recently it was down towards the bottom of the range, but now it's climbing up here a little bit. Uh, so far, you have a positive slope in your moving average. Oops. So far, you have a positive slope in your moving average. Let's see if we can get the 200 back in. So far, you have a positive slope in your moving average, and uh, the price has remained above the moving average. Let's do something here just for fun. Um, Let's try daylight with just a uh, a one-day moving average, and you'll see where I'm going with this. Uh, daylight means the lows are greater than the moving average. Let's just try a one-day moving average and see what happens. One, so that's like a closing price. So here's just a little simple thing to take home. As long as the price has daylight above the moving average. Now, ideally, you want to look at the lows when you're doing this, but just to make things simple for this presentation, as long as you have daylight, meaning that you can see a gap between the price and the moving average, and that continues 
not just a couple days, but it continues a little bit longer term. That plus the fact that you're not too far from all-time highs, you want to err on the side of that longer term trend, err on the side of moving average. There's nothing magical about moving average. If you buy every time a market crosses above and below moving average, you'll lose your butt. But if you pay attention to this daylight, notice that there wasn't much daylight here and there wasn't much daylight here. But there was quite a bit here and quite a bit here and quite a bit here, okay? And then quite a bit here. So you can see when a market is trending, now that's the big caveat there, okay? So don't go out and try to buy and sell every time it crosses above or below. But when a market is trending, paying attention to daylight can really pay off, okay? So... The P's are okay. Again, stuck in a sideways range. Longer term, you could argue they're still in an uptrend. And, of course, they're not that far from new highs. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Stalling out a little bit today. That's a bit of a bummer. Let's not get too caught up in the micro, but it is a tiny bit of a bummer. But let's just look at where we are. We're about a percent and a half, give or take a little bit, away from all, from oh, almost at all time, about 15-year highs. By the way, those who said uh, we never see all-time highs in a NASDAQ again, in your face. We've only been, um, I didn't mean to do that, but uh, since we did it, let's do it. You've only been right for 15 years, so, and maybe you will be right. They said never. Never say never when it comes to markets. Okay, just for S and Gs, let's do the uh, daylight thing here with the closing moving, closing end lows. You can see just following the closes or even the lows can help to keep you on the right side of the market, okay? Let's take the price out just for fun. And see, just by accident, I'm kind of backing into a few things. This is the fun part of, of doing these lectures, okay? So you can see, look at the daylight here, okay? Not that you just want to trade this in and of itself, but it is a little trick you can use to help keep you on the right side of the market. Yeah, a little daylight to the downside here. Nothing to get you worried about. But look at this trend here. For the most part, eh, a little bit of daylight to the downside here, but it didn't materialize. And then we continue on higher. So that daylight can really help to keep you on the right side of the market. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Now, two days ago in the service, I told my peeps that I was a little bit worried about the Rusty because it was starting to take on a bit of a head and shoulders top look to it. Now, don't rush out into the street and start screaming head and shoulders, head and shoulders, head and shoulders. But do pay attention to the pattern and do wait for either a bow tie or a first thrust or some sort of pattern, even a breakdown out of a range before getting too excited about a classical technical analysis pattern such as a head and shoulder top. But yesterday I felt a lot better about it because we were moving up nicely and then today we're kind of coming back in. So this has got to be a little concerted here. But as usual, we'll take things one day at a time. We're still only about a percent away from all-time highs. And then all those things I just talked about, let's put in like a 200-day moving average just for S&Gs. Uh, you can see we're still well above the 200-day moving average. So the longer-term trend so far is up. Okay. Um, yesterday it was kind of cool to see drugs come back with a vengeance. Tiny bit of follow-through today, so not too, too bad. Ditto for biotech, but not much follow-through today. But you can see these areas, kind of longer term, could, could be losing a little bit of steam. And that's why I was excited about yesterday's action, especially the drugs, because they were almost back to new highs again. So what do you do with your positions when, when the sector starts losing steam? Nothing. Honor your stops. What do you do on potential new positions? Well, number one, be selective. Again, I always preach stops. But your best defense is a good offense. So pick the best stocks to begin with. So if the sector does get a little sideways, does lose a little bit of momentum, make sure you're picking the best stocks to begin with. Even get a little bit more selective. Sometimes I think I'm selective almost to a fault. But it's so funny. Early in my career, I was looking to make as many trades as I could. Now that I'm getting a little bit older, a lot bit older, I'm, I'm looking to make fewer and fewer trades. So I'm not, I think, long and hard after market before I want to trade the next day. And that's made me a better trader. Yeah, I'll miss a few moves here and there, but so what? I think the bottom line is you do have to become more and more selective. And then, yeah, as I said before, sometimes I'll lose a client in the service. Well, why'd you quit? Uh, 
It's not active enough for me. It's like, not active enough? What do you mean? That doesn't make any sense. You only want to trade when there's an opportunity. You don't want to trade for excitement. Uh, transports, before I digress too far, they're stuck in the middle of a rage and been there for months. Some people like the transports to confirm what's going on in indices. I like everything to confirm what's going on in indices, so I don't get too caught up in one particular sector. But the Dow theorists are big, huge fans of the transports. Semis broke down in here, and they were looking a little abysmal, and now they're kind of clawing their way back up. But let's not start kissing each other here just yet. This could turn into a gatekeeper or something, okay? But hopefully, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we'll see some upside follow through and new highs to here. So um, I, I hate to even use the word cautiously optimistic because they still look a little dubious in here. But hopefully we'll see some new highs sooner rather than later in some of these areas. Big bull in the energies. We've got a triple bottom working, okay? Dave, you said not to trade off of classical technical analysis paths. Yeah, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. But let's look at what's going on here. We've got a bow tie that is formed off of multi, multi-year lows. How many year lows is that? Let's take a look at a weekly chart. Uh, yeah, you've got to go all the way back to 2010, 2011, okay? We hadn't been lower, significantly lower since 2009. So that's a pretty serious bottom in place in energies. And notice that we're getting a bow tie forming here. And we're long TGA, TGA, just to show you. Uh, what a good setup looks like. And notice that it bottomed out in here. It's made a bow tie. It doesn't have much overhead resistance until about six bucks a share. It's about a 50% move higher. Okay. I, you know what? If it goes up 50% and stops, I'm, I'm okay with that. So keep an eye out for some opportunities in the energy. Just take a look at like USO, which is, uh, in the, is actually in the service today, but it's a big, thick stock. So I think it's okay to mention that. To everyone, notice that it's got a, a double bottom, and this bottom is lower than this bottom. That's my favorite type of double bottom because that fakes out the most people. The most people say, ah, I took up the old lows. It's going to keep on going lower. So you've got more and more shorts that pile on in. The Johnny from Whaley's are stuck in that market. And the longs have been holding on forever, finally throwing a towel. So that purge, that cleansing process really can help out. But we've got a bit of a bow tie working here. You got a nice little knockout move. It's a bit of a pioneer pattern. And like the American pioneers, you either get the arrows or the gold in your back. Or, I'm sorry, you either could get the gold or you could get arrows in your back. One mountain dude tomorrow. Next time, Dave. But it looks pretty good. It looks like it's bottoming out in here. I'm not a huge fan of trading efficient markets. I did an article on it's another one of those articles I need to find. Uh, but it was recently published. It made the cover story of Traders Magazine. And do read that article. And shoot me an email and to remind me, and I'll, I'll be happy to put that up on my website, too, uh, once I get the link. But it's either coming out this month or it was last month or next month, somewhere in there. I'm always confused because when I edit an article or proof an article, it's always like uh, two months out. So I never know when the articles are coming out. Anyway, enough about, enough about me. What do you think about me? Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? Um, the foods have come back with a vengeance. I'm not a huge – I like to eat food, but I'm not a huge fan of trading the foods because they can be a little choppy. But it's kind of interesting to see they're kind of banging out new highs in here recently. Uh, real estate got creamed. And real estate sort of had – it's kind of strange, but real estate sort of had nine lives in here. It looked like it was dying. It had like a micro first thrust in here down or a failed pullback, whatever you want to call that. And it looked like it was just going to go – Go to hell in a handbasket, right? And then it had this throwback rally, and then now it looks like it's finally topping out. I'm not a big fan. The HV is kind of low here. I'm not a huge fan of these stocks. But it does look like real estate has topped out. So I don't know if that means anything for repercussions throughout the market. But what I would recommend you do is just look at as many sectors as possible and study what's going on. Notice like hardware, and there's a lot of other sectors too, are wide and loose and sideways like let's say the P's, and down towards the bottom of their range. And as I said, the column a few times recently, let's just hope they don't jump off the bottom of their range. But So it's a little mixed out there, but if you pick your spots carefully, there's still some opportunities. I'm pretty excited about the energy stocks. China right now has been uh, really good. Let's take a look at the FXI. I mean, this is due for a correction, but take a look at this. I mean, can you believe that? Okay. 
Um, you know, how much is enough? Well, who knows? It's a bubble. Who cares? We we're bubble hunters, okay? And yeah, sooner or later they pop, but that's what a trailing stop is for. When they pop, you gotta stop. Feel like uh, Johnny Crocker and you know, blow them fit, gotta quit. <laughs> when the bubble pop, you better have a stop. All right, let's open it up for individual stock questions. Let me uh, pull up uh, bonds real quick where you guys are punching in your stock questions. Um, bonds are kind of interesting in here. They're getting a little sideways. They looked, again, they look like it looked like the end of the world, and the stock market was beginning to uh, come unglued because of it. And then bonds came back up, and then stocks sort of stabilized. And um, stocks were actually lower than they were before the rate scare, which is kind of, it's kind of uh, a little perverse. It's like, ooh. Rates are going up, stocks went down, and then rates went back down, and then stocks were actually lower than they were. So, like, rates were a little lower. So be careful if you're trying to make that direct correlation when you're doing your intermarket analysis, as I often preach, because sometimes you can have disconnects. And as Murphy said in, in his book, who wrote, who literally wrote the book of Intermarket Technical Analysis, uh, and by the way, you should read that book. It's on my website somewhere. I think it's uh, Intermarket Technical Analysis of, of – he changed the name of it, but I think it's an intermarket technical analysis of the financial markets, maybe. Uh, but if you get intermarket technical analysis in Murphy, there's a little uh, Amazon search box on my website. If you use that, I'll probably make um, 30 cents, and uh, I'll throw it in a plate on Sunday. It's intermarket technical analysis is the name of the book. You just type it in that little Amazon search box on my website. Or uh, if you dig around my web website under books, on a store, I have a list of more books you should read. It should be on the bottom of the page. But intermarket technical analysis only matters when it matters. But bonds are kind of stabilizing here. So rates are still really, really low. So it's the fear, I think, of higher rates is more important than the absolute level of rates. All right, Nate wants to know about QUNR, okay? Yeah, I've been watching this one. This, is, this one's on one of my momentum lists, and it looks good, okay? Um, it's had a pretty good run. So when they have a good run like this, you want to look for kind of a deep pullback. So that's what the chart should look like before you go to trade it. Wait for a deep pullback. In a case like this, a trend knockout is an absolute beautiful pattern, okay, because it, because it's it's ran up so far so fast. You want to see people knocked out of the move. All right, Peters wants to know about uh, NBIX. Um, well, what's jumping out of me, a couple things are jumping out of me. Notice that I've drawn this, this uh, decelerating trend in here from last time. And notice that it kind of pulled back all the way to back here, which gave up quite a bit of trading. Okay, that wasn't that horrible. But now notice that it's just kind of crawling back up to its old highs. Kind of like in the spirit of the gatekeeper. You know how the gatekeeper, the stock stalls short of its prior highs. So it's starting to look a little toppy to me. Also, if you kind of... Uh, you know, you dust off that uh, Murphy and Cream book, or, or even better, dust off your Schaubacher book on technical analysis, and you're going to see that it is possibly a head and shoulders in the works, okay? So I would not rush out and buy this stock. If you're long, stay long, okay? Maybe it's just correcting and might take off again, but I would not buy it as a new trade. All right, Michael says, and I guess this was about an hour ago when I was busy pontificating. He says, you never know if the next trade will make you year. So go for it, but manage the risk. Amen. Because every now and then in the service, I'd be like, you know, I kind of like this stock. It looks a little risky, and I, and I hate to put it on the service because I'm worried about my people could end up in a losing trade. Well, any trade could be losing trades. Like, boy, it sure looks like it has potential. And then at some point I'll say, well, so what? Your risk is... Is this much, and I'm making the little bitty, um, my fingers are close together, and then I'm holding out my arms as wide as I can stretch, which is about six feet. I'm six foot two. Okay, so that's your possible reward. And like Michael says, that might make you year. So if you get stopped out, so what? You know, like I said, I said good day, sir. All right, BTX as a long, BTX. Uh, no, you've got a, another one of these. Um, gatekeeper looking patterns 
Also notice your breakout bar was only a one only one day. I think we talked about this one last week, uh, John. So uh, no, I would avoid that particular stock. I wouldn't short it. Well, it's a little uh, low to short and kind of thin to short, but but I would certainly avoid it as a possible long. QIHU, QIHU. Um, maybe. Maybe on a little bit of if it, if it cleared this base a little bit, maybe on a pullback. I see what you're seeing, uh, but it does have quite a bit of overhead uh, supply to it. Let's put a bow tie in. It's probably yeah, it's bow tied in here, or it's trying to bow tie. Uh, if it just was a little bit higher, if it was up here somewhere before pullback, so uh, check back off the check back. Oh, next week no show, but um, come back the week after. We'll take a look at it. NPTN. NPTN. A uh, little bit on the thin side. Um, that's not bad. Okay, you got a little bit of problems back here, but not too bad. I'm going to give you a not bad on that. Now, the only thing that's kind of jumping out of me is you did have a pretty good run in here. You had about a 200% run, and it pulled back. That's not bad. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Quite a few days of the pullback, though. But, yeah, if you put an entry in around 650, and if it doesn't hit it, don't take it. Maybe eh, maybe a little bit lower, maybe around 625 or so. But that's not a bad-looking stock. But it, it has it, – it's a dangerous-looking setup because it's ran so far so fast. If you're already long, then stay long because it looks like it's just corrected here and ready to take off again. But not bad. That's not bad. Okay, any more? Had a quiet bunch today. I guess I drove everybody off. <laughs> Remember, do not operate heavy machinery after watching this. Okay, well, while we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I am honored uh, to be here, and, and I am humbled by your appearance. So thank you so much. Without you, there is no show. Um, no show next week. I'll be traveling. I'm speaking at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting, so I'll be uh, I'll be traveling. Um, or I'm on, I might still be here on Thursday, but I won't have time to do the show. So anyway, uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again. And uh, I guess we'll talk again in two weeks. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Heather. Thank you.